From the University of Tulsa, this is Sacred and Profane Love, a podcast that explores how literature, philosophy, and theology can help us think more deeply about love, happiness, and meaning in human life. I am Jennifer Frey, Dean of the Honors College at TU and your host. I invite you to join me and my guests, which range from award-winning fiction writers, poets, and literary critics, to philosophers and scholars from a range of disciplines, as we explore in conversation how the enjoyment of art might be, as the late philosopher and novelist Iris Murdoch has so provocatively suggested, a training in the love of virtue. I hope these conversations will enrich your life, inspire you to crack open some good books, and bring your attention back to what ultimately matters in the end. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Sacred and Profane Love. I'm just super excited to be joined by Aaron Gwynn this morning. Aaron is an American short story author, novelist, and English professor at UNC Charlotte. He's also just an absolutely incredible follow on the app formerly known as Twitter, now X, where his handle is at American Gwyn, and that's how I know about him. And he's also a Tolson, so must be amazing. Anyway, welcome to the podcast, Aaron. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm such a fan of your Twitter feed, X feed. It's too just, sweet. you never miss. I'll put it that way. You're too sweet. You're too sweet. <laughs> so I have to ask you, you're from Tulsa. Where in Tulsa are you from? So I was born in Tulsa, but I grew up in Seminole County on a little cattle ranch there. Oh, wow. So you're like really Oklahoma. Really Oklahoma. I didn't leave. I did my master's at Oklahoma State and didn't leave mm-hmm. until... I was 28 when I went to do my PhD. Well, I've almost been here for a year. And okay. yeah, I love Tulsa. It's pretty. I love Oklahoma. Do you miss it? I have family back there, so I miss them. Yeah. Do you come back often? I haven't been back for a while. I need to come back. I need to come back. Usually my family visits yeah. me here. Well, when you come back, we are going to have to get you in the studio. It'd be great. In the church studio in downtown Tulsa. It's awesome. absolutely fantastic. Okay, so we are here today to talk about Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. And I have been wanting to podcast on this, honestly, since I started podcasting. (laughs) But I find it daunting. Um, I find this novel fascinating and compelling, but also daunting. I was waiting to find the right person. And then you magically appeared on my X feed. And I was like, this is the guy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is the guy who has to come on for what is my third episode now on Cormac McCarthy. So I've done an episode on Sutri. I've done an episode on The Road. And it's time for Blood Meridian. So let's start with the basics. Can you tell us about Cormac McCarthy and why you love him so much? Because you seem to be a Cormac McCarthy super fan. I love him. I do love him. I read him first in 1998. I think I read All the Pretty Horses. And at that time, I liked it well enough, but didn't connect with it the way I later would. The next year, I read Blood Meridian. And my first time through, I started to slow down in the middle. And I think I struggled with it at first and then pieced away at it. And then caught that wave at the last third of the book and just it completely bowled me over. As soon as I finished it, I started it right over and my love affair with Cormac's work began. And I went back and read all the other books. But Blood Meridian was the one, particularly the language of Blood Meridian, was the one I connected with most strongly was most influential on my writing and my style and finding a voice for what I was doing at the time. Yeah, he does have a really incredible writing style. And it's hard to describe. I mean, it also evolves. What's interesting to Mm -hmm. me about Blood Meridian is it's his fifth novel, so it's right after Sotri. And I didn't read Sotri until about a year ago. And I was immediately struck by like, this is a different Cormac. Different guy. It's like clearly Cormac McCarthy, but it's also right. sort of different. To me, Blood Meridian's almost like a transition 
and his style to something that is more sparse Mm -hmm. and more bleak, I would say. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, how would you describe his writing style, especially compared to other American authors? So you have the first five novels, the Appalachian novels, heavily influenced by Faulkner. He sends his first novel to Random House because it was the only publisher he knew and the only editor he knew of was Albert Erskine at Knopf because Erskine had been Faulkner's editor. So first five novels stylistically are deeply indebted to Faulkner. And I see Sutri as being his most maximally Faulknerian novel. The prose is Baroque and he Mm -hmm. really just lets himself go. And it's weird because it seems to get that style out of his system by going really hard into that register, that tone. He seems to expunge himself of that, right? Yeah, it seems more disciplined in a way. Another thing about Sutri is you need a dictionary. I mean, my vocabulary went way up at the end of reading that. I was like, wow, that's a lot of ways to describe rivers and rocks. Amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Blood Meridian is more influenced by the King James Bible, and you see it in his use of conjunctions like and. They did this, and they did this, and they did this, and they rode down and saw there, and then about noon, they, and the waves of that, which is a technique that Hemingway popularizes in his short stories and novels, and which he borrows from the King James. And Blood Meridian is also stylistically and thematically heavily influenced by Moby Dick, which Cormac read once every year. And you see little phrases that he picks up from Moby Dick and installs. So there'll be this weird usage of the kid looked across and he was a ragged figure enough. And that usage of enough is directly borrowed from Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, thematically, what is the connection between Blood Meridian and Moby Dick? Oh, gosh. So this all male tribe or gang that is questing in search of something and meet a calamitous end. And also it works, but it's strange all the nautical imagery in Blood Meridian. Groups are spoken of as Argonauts. In the very first chapter, you have the tent Mm -hmm. sink like a large wounded Medusa. You have all this sea imagery and nautical imagery that just permeates Blood Meridian which is interesting in a book that's mostly set in the desert and in the American Southwest. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned nautical imagery, which is true now that you mention it, it's definitely there. But what really struck me was all of the religious imagery. Absolutely. And I'm not sure if this is really apt or just the fact that I've been teaching the Divine Comedy for the past mm-hmm. five weeks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but... There's a lot of imagery that really reminds me of Dante's Hell. Tons of it. Yeah. And I didn't know if that was intentional or if this is special pleading on my part. Cormac was raised Catholic. And I think people who are raised Catholic, like any religious training, you always have that with you. Interestingly, you have all these perversions of Catholic ceremonies and rituals. Yes. Every yes. statue of Christ or the Virgin Mary in Christ, the Christ child is beheaded or disfigured in some way when the judge is making the gunpowder and he's parceling out the powder to Glanton and the men, the men circle past him like communicants, which is the word for the Catholics use for the people who are taking mass. So mm-hmm. you have these twistings of various Catholic rites. I think it's quite important to the book and to Cormac generally. Yeah, this has been remarked upon by many is just kind of like the underlying Catholic themes. And there's this question of whether he's a Catholic novelist. We can table that for now. But in a way, this is a historical novel. Mm -hmm. That's reductive, but it's also sort of true. So one way of getting into this, I think, is to just... Talk a little bit about the historical background and then maybe why he's choosing 
this period of American history to tell this story in? I'll mention this as a way of getting into that. I'm friends with the novelist Tom Franklin, who's a professor now at University of Mississippi, Ole Miss. And he was best friends with the novelist William Gay, who passed on some years back. And when Gay and Cormac were both in Tennessee, Gay carried on a correspondence with Cormac McCarthy. And the last letter he had from Cormac, he asked what he was working on. And Cormac wrote back and said, I'm following a bunch of old boys who go south and it just keeps getting darker and darker. And that was Blood Meridian. Hmm. So I think Cormac was attracted to this moment of westward expansion in American history. And to briefly contextualize what's going on historically, in the 1820s, Mexico had a serious problem with the Comanches. The Comanches were raiding into northern Mexico. Comanches were raiding in their ancestral lands in Texas. So as a way to shield themselves, the Mexican government invited in Anglos, first Moses and Stephen Austin and the original families. But what Mexico was trying to do was to create a meat barrier between themselves and the Comanches. And of course, the Anglos weren't there 10 years before they began to separate from the Mexican government. They began to have their own culture. And then Sam Houston, who was an operative of Andrew Jackson, was sent in to help peel away Texas from Mexico. There was a revolution. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. won. And then Texas becomes a state on February 1st, 1846. At that time, the southern boundary of Texas, as Mexico saw it, was the Nueces River. Texas and the United States wanted it to be the Rio Grande. So mm -hmm. they sent Zachary Taylor, who was a general then, riding up and down the Rio Grande until they were attacked by Mexican troops. And at that time, they said, we're under attack. And they invaded Mexico in 1846, the Mexican-American War. The outcome of that is the United States acquires everything in the Southwest from Texas all the way to the California coast. So the nation adds a third of its present size to its territorial holdings. The fallout of that is you have all these violent men in the Southwest who are veterans of the Mexican-American War. John Joel Glanton was one of them, the historical John Joel Glanton, the leader of Glanton's gang in Blood Meridian. And they were shunned by the American army and the Texas government and then began to venture down into Mexico and contract with Mexico to hunt Apaches who were then raiding into Mexican territory. And that's pretty much the plot of Blood Meridian. Right. And this Glanton's gang, it's not a super plot driven story. I mean, things happen, right. but you can summarize right. them pretty quickly. And it's also a little bit thin on characters. We basically have the kid who by the end is mm -hmm. the man who's coming from Tennessee down into the Southwest. And then we have Judge Holden, right? Who, <laughs> very hard to say in a tidy way what exactly he is. Right. John Joel Glanton, Toad Vine, and then this really fascinating figure to me, it's just Tobin, this ex-priest, but maybe Love he was it. only a novitiate, sort of unclear. Right. And then there are just some secondary characters. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say this as a statement, but really it's a question it's really a story about the kid and the judge. That's right. Yeah. The first drafts of the book are almost entirely that. Yeah. And everybody else is kind of there in a subsidiary way. I think that's right. And I think for me, really trying to understand this novel is about understanding how to understand what's going on with the kid as this story unfolds and he eventually becomes the man, but then also trying to figure out what on earth Judge Holden is, because he's not normal, to put it mildly. He's not normal. That's the way to say it. He's not normal at all. <laughs> yes. If it's a parody of Moby Dick, is he Ahab or is he the whale? Like right. there's something about him that's whale-like. 
Yeah. And just historically, I mean, so Judge Holden's actually based on a real man. We think. We think. Okay. Can you give us like a two minute? Okay. So there is a man named Samuel Chamberlain who was, I believe, from Illinois or Pennsylvania. And when he's a young man, just a little older than the kid, he flees to Texas and he joins the American army and ends up going down into Mexico. He goes AWOL. He doesn't like what he sees. He's terrified. And he ends up with John Joel Glanton and his gang. And he writes a kind of memoir called My Confession later on in life about his time with Glanton's gang. And he talks about this person they call Judge Holden of Texas, who's similar to the judge of Blood Meridian. Now, there are people who really doubt the historical authenticity of Samuel Chamberlain's memoir. And scholars are divided about how much of this is true, but it's definitely where Cormac gets the judge from. And that's the only historical record of Judge Holden that anyone's been able to find. There's a really important book that is a collection of Rip Ford, John Salmon Ford, who was a Texas Ranger, among other things, and Glanton served under him. And in this book, University of Texas Press puts it out called Rip Ford's Texas. You have this footnote. Only 26 when he joined the United States Army in January 1847, John Joel Glanton got into trouble for shooting a Mexican civilian. Glanton claimed he did it in self-defense. Eyewitnesses said he did it in cold blood. When Army police sought to put him in irons, he borrowed food and ammunition from his friend and made for Texas. Later, he re-enlisted in Jack Coffee Hayes' 2nd Regiment and saw action throughout the Mexico City Expedition. In 1849, Glanton, attracted by stories of gold in California, left his wife and two children in San Antonio and headed for the Pacific Coast. He paid his way by killing Apaches and selling the scalps at $50 apiece to Mexican authorities. Some said the scalps were not always Apache. He was killed in an Indian fight at Yuma, Arizona early in 1850. That footnote is the plot of Blood Meridian. And okay. when I read that, I knew immediately Cormac's read this book and he likely mm -hmm. got the idea for the entire novel from that footnote. Yeah. Let's talk about the kid. So the kid is an illiterate runaway, right? right. Who in the beginning just seems along for the ride and then becomes more involved in mm -hmm. the gang and is discovering himself through lots of violent criminal activity. And I just wonder if you could set the stage for us with the kid. You might have a different tack, but I feel like the best way to tackle this novel and mm -hmm. whatever is going on in it is to just start with this figure of the kid and yeah. What's like, going on with him? Like, what's his journey? One thing that does strike me, I just mm -hmm. want to bring it out and then I'll let you talk, is that he's often described as a pilgrim, which mm -hmm. I find absolutely fascinating and certainly cannot be meaningless. Mm -hmm. But I'm also not sure what to do with that. Right. Well, it's his pilgrim's progress, but he's going to hell instead of heaven, right? Like Cormac, the kid is a Tennessean. Right. Mm -hmm. He has this taste for mindless violence, but we never see him participate in the massacres committed by Glanton's gang. In fact, every time there's a massacre, the kid disappears. So after the slaughter of the Helenos, for example, we don't see the kid doing all these horrific things to the villagers. And then after the fight, the narrator locates him in a lake coming up out of the water. Other than self-defense, when he is fleeing the Yumas after the massacre at the Ford, we see him shoot those people in self-defense, the Braves who are coming for him. But we don't see him participate in the massacre. And this, of course, is what the judge will accuse him of at the end of the novel. You alone were mutinous. You alone reserved some corner of clemency in your soul toward the heathen. You broke with the body of which you were pledged apart and poisoned it in all its enterprise. So the judge accuses the kid 
of the very lack of violence that we witness. I see the kid in the early parts of the novel as almost like a camera mount for the reader, that mm -hmm. we're attached to this moving tripod. We move through this land, but it's when the judge reappears in Chihuahua City and they're bailed out of the jail by the Glanton gang, the judge immediately puts an eye on him. The judge is immediately interested in him and mm -hmm. taunts him, always poking at him, prodding at him. Also, his fortune and everything that will happen to the gang is laid out in the tarot card scene. Every prophecy or every prediction comes true. The kid is associated with the Four of Cups, and one meaning that card can have, um, by no means some tarot expert, is that it's associated with mercy, which is what the judge later... And also apathy. It's the very thing that the kid often has. He doesn't want to kill Shelby in the desert, right? He doesn't want to, even though it would be a mercy killing. He's the one who draws the arrow shaft from David Brown's leg. Again and again, mm -hmm. we see in the context of these barbarous men, he's the only one that shows any kind of mercy other than Tobin. Right. And Tobin's another fascinating character for me Absolutely. anyway. But before we get to him, we need to mm -hmm. get to the judge. I don't even know how to begin to describe who the judge is, so I'll let you do it. Yeah, he's a seven foot tall. He's described as a, quote, albino, end quote. Mm -hmm. He's, in Tobin's estimation, as either handed as a spider. He can shoot with both hands. He can draw with both hands simultaneously. He can read and speak five languages. He reads Latin and Greek. He seems to be very well educated and is a remorseless killer. And a theme that runs through the novel is also he's a pedophile and he's mm -hmm. drawn to children, whether he's drawn to their innocence or something else. But Wherever the judge goes, a child goes missing throughout mm -hmm. the entire novel. It's later, sometimes mm -hmm. we see their bodies later on, and he does these horrific things. There's the scene in the cantina where the gang busies itself in this little town, and the judge immediately goes to a cantina, sits in the doorway, fills his pockets with candy, and is trying to hand them to children as they pass. So... Mm -hmm. His horrific fascination with children and crimes against children is a running theme. It's interesting teaching the book because at first students we put off by the hyper violence of it, but they're immediately fascinated by the judge when he reenters the book around page 70, 75. And he's a villain unlike any in American literature. Yes, he is. He seems satanic. Like in some obvious sense, he seems satanic or demonic in the sense that, yes, he's cruel and he seems to delight in killing people. And he seems to delight in a certain kind of meanness, right? The first scene where we're introduced to the judge, he comes in and he accuses this right. preacher. Right. Things that he hasn't done that, of course, ends up in violence for him. And he just seems to delight in it. Delight is the right word. He's ebullient. He's ecstatic. Yeah. You think of like a lesser judge like Anton Chigurh of No Country for Old Men, who's dour mm -hmm. and grim and we're told right. he has no sense of humor the judge he's also an excellent fiddle player he loves mm -hmm. to sing he loves to dance with the ladies he mm -hmm. delight is the right word he delights in these activities that are unthinkable and he's smart right and he's Brilliant. charismatic and people are drawn to him and that's why i say satanic he has so much potential, so much human potential there right. that somehow has become completely perverted or twisted. And then also because obviously, and we'll get there towards the end, there seem to be supernatural elements to the judge. It's unclear that you could even kill the judge. And then, of course, there's this question which comes up in the book. It's like, what's he a judge of? And there's this really incredible scene. I think it's around like 197, 198, mm -hmm. 199, where the judge, in a way, he's talking about what he's after. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And he says something so striking. He says, whatever in creation exists without my knowledge exists without my consent. Only nature can enslave man. And only when the existence of each last entity is routed out and made to stand naked before him, will he be properly suzerain of the earth, where this is a ruler, even when there are other rulers, his authority countermands local judgments. And for him, he says, the man who sets himself the task of singling out the thread of order from the tapestry will by the decision alone have taken charge of the world. And it is only by such taking charge that he will effect a way to dictate the terms of his own fate. And this is in a way kind of foreshadowing Mm -hmm. No Country for Old Men and this figure Mm -hmm. of Anton Chigurh. But like, there is this question of fate and Mm -hmm. chance and to what extent any of them are in control. And this seems to be something that is coming up in a lot of Mm -hmm. Cormac McCarthy's works, but it seems to be the thing that the judge is actually on about. He's not just a nihilist. It's not that he just revels in meanness and that's it. He's after something. He's collecting souls, right? Well, say more about that, please. Well, the judge is an artist and has a sketchbook. And every time they camp, he goes searching for various artifacts. So we see him in an early scene find an old piece of Spanish armor, I believe like a pauldron, right? And he sketches it in profile and perspective. And he sketches the other artifacts. And when he's done... He throws them in the fire and destroys them. There's a scene where they're riding by a rock ledge and the native people in the long ago have drawn various figures in the rock, have etched figures in the rock. And the judge rides up, copies them into his sketchbook, and then gets a piece of rock and scrapples them out. So the judge will find various artifacts. He'll sketch them into his book. And then when he's done that, he'll destroy the original. So the only record that is left is the judge's sketches. Just like most people will never read a history of the American Southwest, but they'll read Blood Meridian. They'll read McCarthy's Mm -hmm. sketch, McCarthy's representation. There's a famous scene where Tobin has told the story of the judge's gunpowder. And the kid listens to all that. His only question is, what's he a judge of? And Right. The priest repeats the line back and the kid wants to know. And the priest just says, quiet, he's ears like a fox. So the question is set up for the reader as an important question and as one, right. don't dare speak. Then later on, when the kid is wounded after the Yuma attack and Glanton's gang has been destroyed, he has an arrow shaft in his leg and he goes to a doctor in San Diego and the doctor removes it and he's lying in the sleep of ether and he has this dream this is on 309 in that sleep and in sleeps to follow the judge did visit who would come other a great shambling mutant silent and serene in his delirium he the kid ransacked the linens of his palate for arms but there were none the judge smiled the fool was no longer there but another man And this other man he could never see in his entirety, but he seemed an artisan and a worker in metal. The judge enshadowed him where he crouched at his trade, but he was a cold forger, a counterfeiter, who worked with hammer and die, perhaps under some indictment and an exile from men's fires, hammering out like his own conjectural destiny all through the night of his becoming some coinage for a dawn that would not be. It is this false moneyer with his gravers and burns who seeks favor with the judge, and he is at contriving from cold slag brute in the crucible a face that will pass, an image that will render this residual specie current in the markets where men barter. Of this is the judge judge, and the night does not end. So the judge there is a judge of representation. He's a judge of counterfeits. And what the judge is hoping is he'll find the artisan that will be able 
to pass the counterfeit for the real, to render a fake coin true and current to be currency. And that's what the judge seeks. The judge seeks the person who can make a copy and have that be taken as the genuine article, which is what most people think of Blood Meridian. This representation, this copy that Cormac McCarthy has made of the American Southwest at this time, this is what happened. Well, it's not what happened. It's Cormac's no. copy of what happened. Yeah. So it's kind of revelation and a dream. Mm -hmm. But it raises more questions for me than it answers. Hmm. Right. So he's a judge of counterfeits, rendering a fake coin true. Can you say more about how we're to understand those claims? Is it a claim about art and what art does? Is it a claim about people? Is it a claim about both? I think it's a claim about fiction. Okay. We start off this conversation and you're like, well, in some senses, this is a historical novel, right? And it is, but it's not historically accurate always. People mm -hmm. were never exactly like the people that Blood Meridian represents. Texas was not this blood-drenched place unilaterally where you saw people and killed them just because they were people. You read Noah Smithwick's <clears throat> memoir about the 1830s and 40s in Texas. People were cordial. People were happy to see each other. There was community. And Cormac snips that part and focuses only on the violence. Only the violence is in frame in this book. So I think the judge's claim is much the claim of a fiction writer who wishes to create a counterfeit that's so convincing, that's so compelling that it becomes currency, that it becomes the gold standard. So a lot of people read Blood Meridian and they think, wow, Texas was a violent place. Well, it was a violent place, right? But the Comanches never sodomized the dead and dying. That never happened. Mm -hmm. You never had quite this level of violence. It's perfect mm -hmm. for the novel. It's perfect for Cormac's Dantean vision of this time. And there's plenty of violence, plenty of war crimes, plenty of horror not the kind of horror exactly we see in Blood Meridian, and not only horror, which is what we see in Blood Meridian. Mm -hmm. Well, let me keep asking about this. I mean, mm -hmm. let's just talk about the violence in this novel. We don't have to go over it, but it's very extreme, and it hits you right away, and it's pretty much sustained throughout right. the novel that's just a lot of very gratuitous, very macabre violence. Right. And that's all obviously intentional. As you yourself mm -hmm. point out, it's not accurate. Like it wasn't this bad. Nope, it was not. And what work is the violence doing in the novel? Why make it so violent? That's a choice. I am assuming that it's not for the sake of sensationalism. He is a genius and he doesn't mm -hmm. do cheap tricks like that. That's right. But what is the point of the violence? If I think of somebody like Flannery O'Connor, where right. just tons of super weird characters and right. really disturbing violence, but every bit of violence has a meaning. And it's redemptive. It has a redemptive purpose. Exactly. It's all tied up with the action of grace. I am right. not quite sure what to do with all the violence in Cormac McCarthy's novel. So please help me out with that. Well, it's what people struggle with with this book. And I think I struggled with it in my first read. Now I've read the book many times and I'm very used to it. I know the book well. I know what's going to occur. So the violence and the grotesque stuff does not hit me the way you see something horrible on the news. You're going down the road and there's a wreck and you have to look away. And it's horrible. You have all these. I don't have that oppressive feeling. And the violence in this novel hits me like an energy. There's an exhilaration to Cormac's representation of these violent acts. And I think that drives the book. It does. I mean, it drives the plot. 
Right. But to what end is my question. In some ways, it's its own end. In some ways, the representation of this hell is its own end. But it's also propulsive and not just narratively propulsive. There's an energy to it. There's a dark energy. Mm -hmm. And it is macabre, but it's also thrilling. Like the representation of violence here is thrilling. Well, it's certainly thrilling to characters like the judge. For example, well, if you've seen violence in real life, if you've witnessed violence, if you're a good person, an empathetic person, you're horrified. You want away from it. You don't want to be a part of it. You feel for the people that it's happening to. You have revulsion toward the people who commit it. I think there's a different, and it's part of the indoctrination of the book that once you are far enough into the book, the representation of violence stops affecting mm -hmm. you in the same way. And my students always say the same thing. By the middle of the novel, someone says something about violence and they're like, yeah, but we're used to it now. Yeah, I just wanna keep pressing a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you talk about it being a sort of representation of hell, but the violence in hell from a Christian perspective is mm -hmm. not for its own sake. It is a manifestation of God's justice. So in hell, mm -hmm. people's sins are actually finally revealed to them. In a way, mm -hmm. people in hell actually get what they want, just stripped of the illusion and the fantasy and all of right. that. This is really what we're talking about. It's consequence. It's a consequence of a sin against God. It's sure. justice, right? Sure. And the poetic logic of the contrapasso is one that for the reader is meant to be a kind of revelation. You now see what it really is. Like you see the desire for what it really is. And you also see how it relates to God's justice and his love, mm -hmm. which moves the sun and the stars and all of that. Mm -hmm. So it's not for its own sake. And again, mm -hmm. in Flannery O'Connor, it's not for its own sake. And I guess my question is, if for Cormac, is it for its own sake? In this book, I believe the violence is its own thing. I don't know if the violence is for its own sake, but it's decoupled from the emotional and moral cause and effect that we experience in the actual world and that we experience in other books. There often aren't consequences for the violent acts. Sure, that's true. But let me try this from another mm -hmm. angle. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may just be that I, and for reasons that are either good or bad, who knows, I'm just dissatisfied with the idea of a fictional universe or just a universe in general where we can just say, well, it's just violence and we don't have to see it as meaningful or part of something else. Maybe that's an impulse that Cormac McCarthy is simply denying me. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you talked about how the kid is like a figure of mercy. And then of course mm -hmm. the judge is a judge and that at least has connotations of a just judgment. And now a just judgment can be said in many ways. And that includes the just judgments of an artist with respect mm -hmm. to their goals. So I still think there's this question of what are his powers of discrimination and what is his authority to make these discriminations? And then furthermore, if the judge really is somehow some kind of symbol or figure of the artist, why is he so satanic? <laughs> Oh, well, <laughs> right. I would say this is important. I don't think he's a symbol of the artist. I think he's okay. a judge of the production of the artist. So in the kid's dream, if we're going to put Cormac into it, Cormac is not the judge. Cormac is this frail man and shadowed by the judge whose works mm -hmm. are evaluated, judged by Judge Holden. Yes, but the judge has mm -hmm. to be invested with some authority. Mm -hmm. And that can happen in lots of different ways. There are different kinds of authority. But I guess I'm wondering, what is his authority as a judge? Well, he's larger than everyone else. 
He's more powerful than everyone else. <laughs> he's smarter than everyone else. He's one step ahead of you. He's more quick witted. He's more resourceful. He's the fittest survivor for the hell that the other characters pass through and is unaffected by it. The most affected the judge ever is by the landscape is when he's naked in the desert and his confrontation with the kid and has no clothes. He's sunburned. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. We don't see him bleed. Yeah. Never see him afraid. At times right. only slightly concerned. And then only concerned that the prophecy of the fortune tellers won't come to pass. There's a moment when there are two men named John Jackson, one's black and one's white. And in the tarot card reading, the fortune that black John Jackson is given, as he's referred to in the book, is that in your fate lie our fates all. So John Jackson has to be a part of the entirety of this mission. At one point, John Jackson goes missing and the judge is immediately concerned. And he rides back, talks to Toadvine. And is like, did you see him? Did he come out of the village? And he goes back after him and he makes sure that he's safe. Mm -hmm. Because the judge knows well, this is not his fate. It has to go according to this reading. Yeah, I want to circle back to fate, mm -hmm. but not yet. <laughs> so, I mean, we haven't talked about Tobin, this kind of ex-priest. And just really quickly, what is your take on that character, especially in relation to the kid? I love it that you have a member who's training to be clergy. He has mm -hmm. a divinity degree from Harvard. Mm -hmm. And that he has one foot in the foot of the sacred, right? And one foot in the world of the profane. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's straddling that line and he's often a person that is like narratively, we need to see a character who within the gang is horrified by certain events and yeah. the person more likely to be that way, but still would credibly travel with these people is an ex priest. He's also an historical figure. J. Frank Doby writes about him in Apache Gold and Yake Silver. So mm -hmm. we know he was a real guy. That's a very colorful character, someone who had been, well, he was an invitiate to the order, but then left the church and become right. a scalp hunter. That's fascinating. He does commit mm -hmm. acts of violence, but there are rules. Yeah, he seems to me to almost be the voice of conscience in mm -hmm. the novel or the voice that is like trying to make sense of things. And he's like right. actually giving the kid advice and seems, I mean, of all the characters in the novel, he seems like the most warm-hearted <laughs> of mm -hmm. this particular group of ne'er-do-wells, to put it mm -hmm. mildly, and seems to have not lost his sense of the transcendent. Right. Like, he still sees a transcendent horizon and is still trying to make sense of things and to make sense of things to the kid. And that's why I find him fascinating. But I don't really remember, but you might, I don't really remember Tobin actually trying to make sense of the judge. Does he? Am I forgetting something? No, he kind of says you can't. He says that he thought the judge crazy and then he thought not. He said, Glanton I always knew was mad, but I'm of mm -hmm. two minds about the judge which the reader is, and the reader will always be of two minds about the judge because the judge contains multitudes to the point that you can't narrow him down to one thing. He's not reducible. If you try to reduce him to, Cormac calls, the ultimate atavistic egg, you're going to be standing dark and dumb on a shoreless void. So the judge cannot be explained. The judge cannot be reduced. You can't say the judge is symbolic of X or Y or Z. The judge is himself. He contains these multitudes. He contains contradictions. And to the extent that he's a judge of something, he's a judge of representation. And that's what he's ultimately interested in. Right. I agree. The judge can't just be reduced to like a symbol. He's a real person, but there's almost something supernatural about him. Yes. So I think it's time to talk about this final scene and then the epilogue where the kid, right. now the man, comes back and is reunited with the judge. And it's very strange. Hallucinatory. Yeah. So just for the sake of listeners... 
there's a kid. He joins this gang. They do lots of bad stuff. They kill lots of people, lots of criminal violence. Eventually, the kid ends up in San Diego. So he's disassociated from this for a while. And then he re-encounters the judge. But now no longer is the kid, but the man. It's never clear, Mm. is it, how much time has passed? Yeah, it's 1878 at the end. So how old would he be? He was born in 33, so he's 45. Okay, right. Yeah, so (laughs) just solidly middle-aged. So can we talk about this final encounter? Because... The novel basically ends there. Yeah. So he walks out of the tavern after being, he goes into one of the prostitutes and that doesn't help. 333, he went down the walkboard toward the Jake's, the outhouse. He stood outside listening to the voices fading away and he looked again at the silent tracks of the stars where they died over the darkened hills. Then he opened the rough board door of the Jake's and stepped in. The judge was seated upon the closet. He was naked, and he rose up smiling and gathered him in his arms against his immense and terrible flesh and shot the wooden bar latch home behind him. Cut. Other men walked down to the Jake's. Eventually, there's a man standing outside saying, I wouldn't go in there if I were you. And a man finally does. And he says, oh, my God. So in a novel Mm -hmm. that has shown two different things. It's shown us in meticulous detail the most horrific acts of violence we can imagine, right? Straight out of Dante, right? Has not shied from that. Then at this critical moment, at the climax, the narrative camera won't show us the kid's fate, now the man's fate. It's rendered obscene, off-scene like Greek tragedy would represent acts of violence. We've also seen the judge as a pedophile, as someone who practices violence against children, and particularly the connotation of sexual violence. So critics conclude, and I believe this is correct, that the kid is raped to death at the end of the novel. This is what happens. And we know that because of the suggestions of what There would be jokes about what men did in the Jakes. Historically, we know that because of the judge's predilections, because of his violence against children, because of the meticulous detail that the novel details the violence in, we see every single kind of thing portrayed, but the narrative camera doesn't show us this final act. And what we can imagine is way worse than anything McCarthy could have depicted. Right. So the most important thing is cut because of the way that acts upon the reader. And because the way we start with a question, you're like, we got to talk about what happens. And you're already imagining the worst thing Mm -hmm. because it's not depicted. Right. And I think it's correct that it's not depicted. I think that would have been a really critical error of judgment. I agree. But the last paragraph We just have the judge dancing totally naked, Mm -hmm. like an enormous infant. And forever young. Yeah, he never sleeps. He says, he says he'll never die. Right. Mm -hmm. And he bows to the fiddlers and sashays backwards and throws back his head and laughs deep in his throat. And he is a great favorite, the judge. He wafts his hat in the lunar dome of his skull, passes palely under the lamps, and he swings about and takes possession of one of the fiddles. And he pirouettes and makes a pass, two passes, dancing and fiddling at once. His feet are light and nimble. He never sleeps. He says that he will never die. He dances in light and in shadow, and he is a great favorite. He never sleeps, the judge. He is dancing, dancing. He says that he will never die. Triumphant. Yeah, help us out. (laughs) However, the judge triumphant, the judge celebratory, seeming as if he'll go on forever. And then you turn the page and there's an epilogue. Yes. There's a man building fence. I know this because I grew up on a ranch doing this. Man using post hole diggers, pulling the dirt out for the fence posts. The point of that is that he's going to lay an inexpensive fence that the technology of barbed wire fenced off the West overnight. 
and stop the cattle drives cold, stop the free movement of people around the American Southwest, all the freedom and horror that we saw portrayed over the past 334 pages is over forever. That way of life is over forever. So the judge says he'll never sleep. He says he'll never die. You turn the page and it's all over. So, I mean, that kind of final image of the judge, which is so striking and really haunting Mm -hmm. the revelry of it and the childlike character of it and the almost supernatural quality of it. Mm -hmm. And then the epilogue being a contradiction of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess my question is, what are we really to make of the judge at the end of the day? I mean, this is my question. This is my struggle with the novel. And maybe... There just is no easy answer to this. It's itself a question. McCarthy's intent is itself a question. Because the feeling, even if you don't articulate to yourself, the feeling that you immediately have is, is he still out there? He says he'll never die. Is he still out there Mm -hmm. circling? Can he make it in a city? Et cetera, Mm -hmm. et cetera. What would the judge be today? So against that, Cormac has stood this other thing that the material reality of the West has changed and changed overnight and forever. Mm -hmm. The old West ended like that. Sure. Yeah. Think of Arizona today, right? Think of Phoenix. It's become tame, to put it mildly. Okay. So here's another sort of question and struggle I have about this Mm -hmm. novel, and that is how universal to make it. So we've already agreed that the judge can't be reduced to a symbol or a token of something and that we shouldn't do that and that that's reductive. But Mm -hmm. this also seems like more than just a story of some stuff that happened. It seems to have much larger themes and the characters seem to, in important ways, stand in Mm -hmm. for... I don't want to say like archetypes or something, but mm-hmm. but there's something universal about it as well, even though it is a story about particular people in a particular country, which has a particular mm-hmm. disturbing origin story. No matter where you go in the origins of the U.S., there's a lot of violence and a lot of domination and cruelty. Mm-hmm. It's still going. Yes. And here's where I would simply say, well, of course it is because we're fallen and sin is Mm -hmm. real. But Mm -hmm. that's not necessarily Cormac McCarthy's perspective. But a lot of people do read very religious themes into this novel, seeing Mm -hmm. it as about sin and evil. But it doesn't seem like a theodicy in any sense, because there's no resolution at the end where we have the feeling that, well, it all makes sense because of providence or like somehow all of this violence and horror can at the end of the day be brought into something that can make us feel okay about it. And then there's also this hovering question of fate And this need to control things. So I'm going to let you have the last word here. And I just would invite you to help us think about what are these broader themes and what is McCarthy trying to say if he's trying to say Mm -hmm. anything at all? Well, it's who we were and who we are and who we'll continue to be. The novel opens with an epigraph from the Yuma Daily Sun about finding these prehistoric skulls from 300,000 years ago, right? And about them showing evidence of having been scalped. It's something that's always been with us and always will be with us. And there's no pill you can swallow to make it go away. There's no political ideology or law that can constrain it. There's no ideology that would allow you to wrap your hands around it. You can fence it, but it'll continue. It'll snap Mm -hmm. the fences. Because Mm -hmm. it's more powerful than the fences. Mm -hmm. But if we say it's who we are, it's human nature, is who we are like the judge? No, I don't think the judge is entirely human. I don't either. Yeah, I think we're the kid. Yeah. Let me put it a little bit more pointedly. 
Where is the redemption or the possibility of redemption? The kid has a shot. Okay. What are the signs of that? Well, he tries to, or there's a hope when he starts to carry the Bible, even though he can't read a word of it, that he's looking for something outside of himself and beyond himself and another way of being in the world. He tries to save a woman and then finds he's holding only the shell of an old woman. That woman had been Mm -hmm. dead in that place for years. So there is something in his heart that yearns for redemption. And I think that if you have a thing in your heart that yearns for redemption, you can be redeemed. You might not be redeemed, but you can be redeemed. Mm -hmm. If the judge doesn't eat you. (laughs) Right, 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 right. Okay, last question. Some people say that Blood Meridian is the great American novel. What do you say? I would say along with Absalom, Absalom, Faulkner's Absalom, Absalom, and Melville's Moby Dick, it is the great American novel. I would put forward those three books as representing the best novels Americans have produced, my own opinion. So I take it it follows from that that Blood Meridian is McCarthy's best. I think so. I think Sutri's a masterpiece. I love all the pretty horses. I think it's up there. Sometimes an author produces a work that goes beyond him, her. Yeah. Well, I mean, one sign, and I always tell my students this, but one sign that you're reading a masterwork is that you just always have this itch to come back to it. You never feel like you've really figured it out. And you're disquieted. Yes, exactly. That what great works of art, great works of philosophy really do for us is that they raise these questions or problems for us that stay with us. I think they should upset you. I think they should tilt you over that you are in a comfortable place and a great work of art shakes you up, tilts you out of your chair. It upsets you. Yeah, well, it definitely does that. Okay, well, on that note, thank you so much for coming on. This was really incredible. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's wonderful. Likewise. Thank you for having me. Anytime. You have been listening to Sacred and Profane Love, a podcast hosted by the Honors College at the University of Tulsa. To learn more about the Honors College, please go to our website, utulsa.edu slash honors. To learn more about this podcast, you can check out its website, sacredandprofanelove.com. On the website, you'll find an archive of all our past episodes and guests, and also a blog where we post news related to the work that we do. You can also follow the podcast on Twitter, where our handle is at eudaimoniapod. Finally, if you would like to support this podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash eudaimoniapod. Patrons receive podcast swag and subscriptions with our literary partners, The Point Magazine, Switchyard Magazine, and The Lamp Magazine. We are grateful to our partners for their ongoing support.